Hello there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. While it is giving season, and we have some suggestions on gifts that give back, this is our Vancouver. Coming up, the hard work of truck drivers highlighted after the floods forced them to reroute. And aging out loud with the fairy goddess mothers of Gabriola, who have nothing to hide. But first, compassion and kindness all wrapped up into a lovely little box. Well, it is gift giving season, and today we're featuring some unique ideas that have deep meaning behind them. Now, you've likely heard of subscription boxes where you pay an annual fee and you get items a few times a year. Well, the Heart Mind box is a local option. It contains items to help you connect with others and something to encourage you to take care of yourself, too. So with us today is Fiona Douglas Crampton. Fiona heads the Dalai Lama Center for Peace and Education in Vancouver. Fiona, hello there. Hi, great to be here. So where did this idea for a subscription box come from? Well, you know, we, uh, our normal network is parents and educators, and we focus on social and emotional development for children and youth, what we call heart, mind, well-being. And we wanted to reach out to a much wider crowd because as we all know, mental wellness has become an increasingly important thing during the pandemic. So we decided to create a heart mind box so that we could bring the concept of heart mind well-being to, um, to everyone, anyone, whether they have kids in their lives or not, and um, to help them with their relationships, their well-beings, focus on creativity, et cetera. I like that idea. So uh, give us an idea. What's in the box? Yeah, so there are some amazing things in the box. Probably one of the most unique and interesting is uh, these beautiful um, malas that we had created and made for us unique uh, for us in Nepal. And the idea behind them, and this is the connection to others, it's so important for our well-being, is that you would keep one of these malas for yourself and you would gift one to someone special in your life. And there's this beautiful locked to paper box that they come in, which is kind of a gift on its own. Beautiful. And it's made from a special bush in the Himalayas um, okay. and it's regenerative. So also eco-friendly. Okay, that, that's important these days for sure. What else have you got in there? <laughs> um, there's also this, uh, for fueling creativity, there's a beautiful dot rock painting kit, which we curated and it's got paints, of course, it's got these beautiful um, tools and rocks and everything for making um, the dot rock painting creations. And we actually had uh, a social enterprise 3D print these for us. So there's a unique, interesting story behind that. Um, and then we also have this beautiful tea, which is curated for us. It's a special blend, a heart mind blend made for us from the Assam uh, region in India. And it's the freshest, uh, best quality tea that you can find. And you can also buy this separately on our Heart Mind Box website as well. Okay, so how do items like this, you know, reflect the, the core tenets of the Dalai Lama Center? Yeah, so our focus, as I said, is on heart, mind, well-being, helping um, children and youth to become secure and calm, alert and engaged, get along with others, be compassionate and kind, and solve problems peacefully. And that's what we wanted to try and reflect as much as possible in the boxes. So there's always going to be something that's helping you connect with other people and build and strengthen your relationships. That's really important. And usually something that has a focus on creativity, especially things that are meditative. And then other items that are just generally, we know from research, are good for your well-being overall. Okay. And so then some special artisan uh, sort of uh, items as well. Nice. Sorry to jump in there, but so this is not just a box for for the season. This is uh, something that you that will change and adapt with different different um, contents th throughout the year potentially. Absolutely. Each uh, box is going to be unique and different. Um, there's only going to be one version of each box, and so um, this is the kind of thing that would uh, go throughout every season, for sure. And you can buy them separately as a, a single gift as well. Okay, and uh, you're raising money for the Dalai Lama Center there. Where, where exactly does the, the money from the sale of these go towards? Yeah, so we, um, as I said, we focus on social and emotional development for children and youth. We provide um, both locally and, of course, uh, internationally now um, with all of our virtual offerings, 
workshops, resources. Um, we've just developed an online course with certification, webinars, all sorts of tools and programming in schools and in the community that help support that foundational uh, social emotional development of children, which is so important. Yeah, and, and what so, would you say that the last year has been like, you know, uh, charity work <laughs> like yours for, for the Dalai Lama Center does? I mean, it's it's been pretty unique, hasn't it? It has been a bit wild as uh, for us as for many, but what we've seen is because of this focus on mental wellness, um, we have seen an increase in need for and engagement with our resources of about 300%. And last year we were able to reach 700,000 children and youth through the work that we do. So we, you get a lot of bang for your buck with our, with our, um, the, a donation to our um, organization and uh, investment in the Heart Mind Box. Fiona, thank you so much for joining us and all the best of the season to you. Thank you so much. This is our all right, it's time for one of our favorite features. This is where we get to showcase a number of the photographs that are sent in by you, our audience. Thank you very much. And first up today, Mira Bellis was out for a hike and took this city view on the way down Black Mountain in West Vancouver. Just lovely. And Nick Detman was out in the rain on soggy Jericho Beach. It's been soggy a lot lately. Thanks so much to Nick for sharing that one with us. And finally, Saiteja Dopalapudi was out for a walk in the dark and took in this little bit of seasonal cheer at Science World. Thank you so much. And do send us more. It's easy. Just uh, email your favorites to us, bcphotos at cbc.ca. That's bcphotos at cbc.ca. Now, the people whose job it is to bring food and supplies to our stores have been working overtime since the floods hit. Truck drivers have been contending with many road closures, and it means they had to find alternate routes. Well, Ian Hannah Mansing brings us their story. Another setback this weekend on trying to restore Canada's supply chain. Highway 1, which had been reopened between Vancouver and Hope on Thursday, a vital link in the chain, shut down again. But even when it's open, it's slow going. This was the scene at a truck stop in Hope Thursday evening when one east-west route was still available. It took Gord Statham an extra four and a half hours to bring a load of food from Calgary to Hope. He was so close to his legal daily driving limit that he had to wait here for another driver to take the trailer into Vancouver. In the mud slides has been brutal because we have no idea which way we're able to go, what roads are closed or open. The traffic is huge, especially for the truckers on the point of view because it, it just lines and lines and lines of trucks you know and you're not going anywhere anywhere fast and people want their food right away but there's there's nothing we can do about it it's the bc trucking association says every delay each way adds up so give me some descriptions of, of what's happening to the supply chain right now you know we've had to completely redesign and repivot everything Anything that moves east and west uh, just really had to find a different way to get where it's going. The scope of the road rebuilding is staggering. Dozens of slides, washouts and broken bridges are being worked on, some in areas where winter weather will soon set in. We've never seen anything like this in BC in terms of uh, how many highways have been impacted all at once. We have 200 sites across the south coast and interior that were impacted. Uh, some of these highways are vital for the movement of essential goods. And so south of the border beckons, an alternate to get between the coast and the BC interior. The US government has taken away some of the red tape, but again, it all adds time. The reason I go through US, because uh, the loads must go, but uh, the roads are closed right now and yeah, I went uh, two days ago and it takes me from Calgary to, uh, to Vancouver on 17 hours. We work in less because you have to slow down everywhere, snow. It's crazy. If you go through the, all the way through the Canada, going to Calgary, it's just trucks. Rerouting is like four or five hour drives when we go uh, sorry, to Kamloops, Canada-wise. Like 
now maybe uh, five or six hours extra. So let's talk about north and south of the border because, uh, you know, we've talked to some truckers who have had to reroute, I guess. What's the upside and downside of that? Well, what it's done is it's provided a relief valve. Um, it's provided us with some level of access to be able to move east and west. It's really important to know that whereas you and I can go across uh, into the United States in a light vehicle with some basic personal identification, the, the, the process is so much more complicated for a motor carrier. We hear unprecedented uh, as a way of describing so much that's been going on since the rain started to fall uh, a couple of weeks ago almost now. Um, from the trucking industry perspective, how would you describe what's going on right now? Yeah, it ju just absolutely extraordinary. We've seen you know winter events and weather events where multiple passes are closed for a period of time. It might be 12 hours or maybe as long as a day and a half. Um, but we've never seen anything like this. Gord Statham says it has been an anxious time for his customers. Yeah, people were phoning at, like hours ahead of time see where, where we're at, where the truck's sitting, or if it's available, when it's going to be here. And all we can tell them is like, when we hear that, you'll be the first to know when the truck's there. <laughs> and when you do arrive? Oh, they're really happy to see us. <laughs> because we're got it there, yeah. Ian, thank you so much for that. Well, it is a challenging year, again. And the need for food has never been greater in our province. Well, CBC Vancouver has just hosted our annual Food Bank Day, and we invited many of this province's performing artists to take part. Jessica lives here in Vancouver, and she made a stop animation video to go along with her seasonal song. So just take a look.
Coming up, Johanna Wagstaff looks at the winter forecast for the entire country. I'm not saying La Nina is all to blame for the relentless rain we've seen across BC this November, but it's part of the puzzle. And what better way to talk about La Nina is in the middle of one of the atmospheric river events. Now we do see atmospheric rivers here on the West Coast every fall into winter. It's part of our hazards here in British Columbia, but a La Nina may stack the deck add to that climate change and the interacting events of climate infused weather disasters and you have a setup for the kind of season we've seen here in southwestern bc so what is la nina well it's all part of what we call the el nino southern oscillation the elso uh, meteorologists look at this every season uh, for clues about what the season ahead might hold and it all starts down in the equatorial pacific uh, the trade winds are either stronger or weaker than normal, meaning warmer than normal equatorial waters, that's El Nino, or cooler than normal, when warmer water gets pushed away and cold water upwells from deeper lowers of the ocean. That's La Nina, and it changes weather patterns all over the world. And for Canada, it really shifts the position of our jet stream, that fast, narrow band of moving air that basically carries our weather systems around. So for the West Coast, where we have higher confidence in the impacts of a La Nina, typically it means stormier and cooler than normal. And we are certainly seeing a classic La Nina setup here on the West Coast, amplified by other factors, but this is a La Nina setup. Uh, and if you take a look at Environment Canada's seasonal outlook for the next three months, December, January, February, that is indeed what the forecast looks like. Cooler than normal all the way through to the Great Lakes. And then on the east side, we have a very different storm track. Generally, La Nina means uh, a more active storm track across the Great Lakes, more chance of freezing rain events, and uh, potentially more warmer air in through Atlantic Canada. So very classic coast to coast La Nina setup. The forecast for La Nina is 90% that it'll continue through the winter months and 50% that it'll linger into springtime. And now your science mark. If you have a science question, send me a tweet and I'll try to get it answered. You are looking at the lovely images from the fairy goddess mothers of Gabriola calendar. The annual project raises money for local charities on the island, but it also raises the spirits of the 50 women who bear all for the good of others. Well, with us today is Carrie Ann Marshall. She's on Gabriola Island. Carrie Ann, hello there. Hi, Gloria. How are you today? I am doing great, and thank you so much. I've been going through this calendar, and it makes me smile so much. How much fun did you have putting this together? It was so exciting. It really was a hugely exciting project, and we had a great time doing it, as you can see from the pictures. Uh, we can certainly see from the pictures. So not only you, you show yourselves in all your natural beauty, but you feature the natural beauty of the island as well. So how do you decide, first of all, where to go and set up these shoots? Well, those shoots were done everywhere on Gabriola, uh, so public public parks, public beaches, and private residences as well. Uh, so on public parks, we ended up with a lookout sometimes. Uh, we, we had to have people standing on either end of the path so that they, uh, they didn't come into the chute. And um, many people offered their properties as well. So oh, it was wonderful. Okay, no, I can imagine it would, it would create a fair amount of uh, a looky-loo interest, <laughs> that type of thing. But when you, when you put the calendar together, you're not doing it all in one shoot. Just uh, how do you space it out throughout the year? Well, this calendar was shot in real time. So we did one, one shoot a month. And um, we basically just uh, made, it, made it work. <laughs> okay, so you put out the word, everybody come on over, take off your clothes, and we're going out into the forest to take pictures? How challenging is that yes, with changing uh, weather all the time? Well, it was really cold out at times. We started with a small group and then word got out on the island. And by the time we were finished, we had over 50 women. So it was a huge, uh, a huge 
uh, pick me up for us. Well, sure. And does it does it sort of translate when you're in the in the aisle at the supermarket when someone says, "Oh, I recognize you." Yes, actually, that did happen to to me and my wife. Uh, we ran into a woman, and and it was, oh, I I didn't know what you looked like with clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure. No, I I understand that this idea was born out of the pandemic. So, how did it all come up, come up, come up in the first place? It was a good friend of mine, Dorothy Angst, uh, had this idea at the end of a full moon ceremony, and she suggested it to a few ladies who thought, well, maybe. Uh, didn't know if this was something that we could pull off, and uh, she she got on this, and she worked really hard to get everybody out and find all the locations and and get the calendar running. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Dorothy ha ha passed away in September. Uh, she had a a uh, a condition, a rare condition called uh, enseophilic fasciitis, or something to that effect, a hardening of the joints, and uh, it, it was very sad and. So the calendar was finished, but we still needed to do the marketing and get everything done for it uh, to go out. Okay. Uh, so we did that without her. In, in honor mm -hmm. of Dorothy, the calendar must go on. Is this something that you're just going to pick up and run with, you think? Are you on to something? That's a great question. I hope we do. Uh, I'm not sure, but I hope we do. It is a lot of effort, uh, but it was really so much fun and so enjoyable. And we have a lot of women asking us if we're going to do it again because they, they missed out this time. Yeah, good point. And where does the money raised go? We have 12 local charities. So everything from animals to our museum to uh, our, our trail people to the Haven Society in Nanaimo, which is a women's shelter, uh, our Arts Council, our... our um, Many, many places. <laughs> yeah, okay, I know. It's like on the spot. You're going to remember them all as soon as we're done with this conversation, I'm sure. And how would you say a project like this and this monthly photo shoot, how does it help women feel less invisible as they age? You know what? I think that the women on this calendar just looked gorgeous and amazing. I think it shows that women of all ages uh, should, should be very proud of their natural bodies. And that was Dorothy's idea too, was that, you know, just because we're a little bit older, it doesn't mean we're not gorgeous. Uh, women on in this calendar are everything from age 50 to 86. And I think it really just shows how vibrant we can be as we age. Well, here's to bringing out the fairy goddess mothers in all women out there. Carrie Ann, thank you and have a great season. Thank you so much. It's a great gift for the fairy goddess mother on your list. For a chance to win one of the fairy goddess mothers of Gabriola calendars, send us an email at ourvancouver at cbc.ca. That's ourvancouver at cbc.ca. If you want to go and see some live music, local indie rockers Yukon Blonde play the Hollywood Theatre December 11th. Then all at once he disappeared within a flash of light. His tattered coat was left behind, his sleigh was taking flight. And the tenors fill the Orpheum Theatre with their magical voices December 13th. Hey, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music, here to share with you some music from a Canadian classical icon, Glenn Gould, like you've never heard him before, in a collaboration with indie darling Meg Remy from the band US Girls. Now, it's a collaboration that is occurring nearly 40 years after Glenn Gould's death. Before I share that track with you, here's Glenn Gould from back in 1957. Uh, that is Glenn Gould with conductor Leonard Bernstein and the New York Philharmonic Orchestra performing some of Bach's Keyboard Concerto No. 1 from back in 57 when Glenn Gould was just 28 years old. 
Now, Gould was born in Toronto in 1932. He died in Toronto in 82 at age 50. And during that time, he became known as one of the most celebrated and fascinating pianists of the 20th century. But he was also considered a maverick and an outlier, a disruptor, known for his unorthodox interpretations of classical music and his eccentric behavior. He was kind of like the Howard Hughes of classical music. So now let's jump ahead to 2021. Billy Wilde is a Toronto-based music producer who wants very much to introduce Glenn Gould's genius and musical output to an entirely new generation this century through a series of controversial Glenn Gould remixes with the blessing of the Gould estate. Check it out. I believe that the only excuse we have for being musicians and for making music in any fashion is to make it differently. Two blunts, finna smoke them till they up, then I'm coming back in, and you know what it's about, I'm getting that clear day, girls on the way. That's just a bit of what Toronto music producer Billy Wilde has been working on, sampling the performances of Glenn Gould into modern pop, hip-hop, and dance tracks on a new album called Uninvited Guests. Now, this project has caused quite a stir amongst the Glenn Gould faithful, some loving it, some absolutely hating it. But Billy Wilde considers Glenn Gould to be the father of electronic music because of his innovative work in the studio and in documentaries. One of the new tracks on the Uninvited Guests album is the one that I mentioned earlier, featuring the vocals and lyrics of indie music star Meg Remy from US Girls. It's called Good Kinda High. I'm telling you I'm high. I'm basically God's private eye. So there you go, that's the piano playing of the legendary Glenn Gould in a posthumous collaboration with Meg Remy from US Girls. It's called Good Kinda High, Meg very much alive. So what do you think? If you're into it, Good Kinda High by US Girls and Glenn Gould is a song that you need to add to your unlikely remixes playlist for this week. I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music. I'll chat again with you next week. Coming up, there are best friends, and then there are best friends who offer to be a surrogate. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, there are some gifts that just surpass all the rest. When Samantha Pollock was diagnosed with cancer, her dreams of being a mom were going to get a lot more complicated. But with the help of her best friend, she has a baby boy who has quite the story to tell and a much bigger family, too. So just watch. On October 13th of 2017, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. My surgeon actually suggested that uh, we go and do an egg retrieval and freeze some embryos just in case all of the treatments, you know, didn't go well. We've been friends for 32 years and in the past we used to joke about, you know, like if you couldn't have kids, I'd carry your kid for you. If we're not married by this age, we'll live together and, you know, if you can't have kids, I'll have your kids. And I proposed surrogacy to my best friend. We actually went out for dinner at Red Robin and she told me to close my eyes and she brought out a soother and put it on my finger and proposed to me and asked me to be her surrogate. It was very cute. And there were a lot of highs like Angela would, we actually live about five minutes from each other and so she would 
we would see each other all the time. She would send videos of Mason moving around in her belly, and that was really exciting. So all of those were definite highs. When I instantly said yes, and, and I thought through the whole process, it was always with visualizing them being handed a baby. So I kind of worked backwards with the whole thing, and, uh, and it was even more joy than I think I expected it to be. It's just the best feeling in the world to have Mason now in our, in our life, and let alone Angela and, and her family and her husband and her three kids too. I think we're now part of a larger family now that Angela has done this. Definitely favorite auntie of all time. Um, she would have been, you know, Mason's aunt anyway because uh, we are basically like sisters. The, obviously they're going to have a special bond and everybody is going, you know, Mason's going to know how he came to be and um, Angela's kids, they were so amazing during the whole thing and, and they're, you know, kind of just like siblings now. Mm -hmm. Some Vancouver elementary school students are learning a lot more about Canada's pre-colonial history with the help of a giant map. The Indigenous Peoples Atlas of Canada is a national exhibition traveling across the country, and the map was unfurled this week at Shaughnessy Heights United Church, and we spoke with organizers and those taking a look. There are no provincial boundaries. There's no um, colonial waterways named. It's, it's all left, and it's a current map of where Indigenous people are living in what we call Canada today. I learned that the purple spots on the map is where the Indigenous lives. The dots are unceded territory. Up there, like uh, kind of where Nunavut is, is a tidal province. It's interesting because they don't think of this as Indigenous land. They just think of it as Canada. Prince Edward Island is called Cradled in the Waves. And there's a legend of Blue Cap. One of the really interesting things about the map is the renaming and reclaiming of original names. Some name places have been anglicized and um, others have actually been preserved. Toronto is trees in the water. Canada is village. Okay, what about Quebec City? It, it's a word that means where the water narrows. It was really exciting for me um, as a settler person to learn stuff that I didn't learn in school. And one of the calls to action is to continue that personal learning journey. I think the map also does a great job of displaying active land claims as a huge component. It's our young people standing up right now, using their voice and defending the land and our waters because we have less than 0.5% of our land base left. We talk a lot about this, about reconciliation. How are we going to mend the relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples? And so I'm really, really proud of the work that the United Church does. We have to reconcile our own history and we have to take on that responsibility of of healing and understanding. We have to be willing to ask questions and to learn together, to move forward together. Like Uncle says, you know, we are all one Nayam Shawat. We are one heart, one mind moving forward together. This is our Vancouver. COVID-19 vaccination clinics are now open to children age 5 to 11. So you might think the children are afraid of needles. And when we went to a clinic, we saw reactions far from the fear that you might expect. The reaction from most? Well, no biggie. Here's how they felt about the jab. I was a little bit nervous at first, and then um, I didn't feel anything. So it was really good, yeah. Is anyone surprised at what it felt like? Yeah. yeah. It was, it was yeah. easy. A lot. It, it didn't, didn't even feel like it went in, actually. Yeah, it felt like nothing. It was I was so <laughs> scared, and then, and then I was like, oh, that's it. How does it feel to all have people from the same school all doing it on the same day? Really uh, good. Yes, yeah. yeah, weird. Because now yeah. we know like the people around yeah. us are getting yeah. back. Yeah. yeah. And you have mu and you have much more people to comfort you than just your family. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like it's fun because all your friends are here. After yeah. All. yeah. So, you guys all have stickers and then you can kind yeah. of congratulate each other, right? Yeah. 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 Anything else we wanted to say that we were surprised about or how we felt? 
I felt good before this. Yeah. I was just like dancing. I was scared. You were, you were I'm really scared. I was, like, scared. I was excited. Cause like I thought it would hurt, but I felt like nothing after. I was scared and excited at the same time. Yeah. I was, I was just lying in my bed and then my and then my mom just just like opened the door and said, guess what, you're getting your COVID-19 vaccine today. And it just fell out of the bed. <laughs> yeah, so my mom came through the door and she's just like, you're getting your COVID vaccine. And I'm like, what? Okay, yay. <laughs> Coming up, we go back 40 years to update you on a cold case, a suspicious fire that destroyed waterfront housing on English Bay. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Well, 40 years ago, one of Vancouver's first iconic apartment buildings was demolished. The Anglesey Lodge was the only waterfront housing left on English Bay when a mysterious fire ended a political controversy. Well, Justin McElroy brings us this historical cold case and what we can learn from it today. Ask people what defines Vancouver, and you might get a few answers. One particular part of the city's design, though, comes up again and again. The big success story we have, which is open space to, and walkways and bike paths all the way around uh, from the central waterfront uh, to the University Endowment Lands. But of course, the seawall didn't come from nowhere. <laughs> Back in 1911, we would have been standing in front of the Inglesea Lodge and it was a gorgeous six-storey brick and terracotta building that had 45 suites and affordable renting. The West End was one of Vancouver's first completed neighbourhoods and the Inglesea one of many apartments right on the waterfront. But just a decade after it was built... From, from 1926, there was a city plan and it was to make Beach Drive into a pleasure drive so people could um, not see the houses but could uh, see the beautiful views of English Bay. Uh, the depression, the war got in the way and it wasn't until the 50s that the city was able to buy back all the houses and uh, demolish them until the only standout was the uh, Inglesea Lodge. After years of being on the chopping block, the plan to tear Inglesea faced blowback. Well, guess what? We had an affordable housing problem then, and uh, we do now. And I thought we could do both. I thought we could build around Anglesey Lodge and, uh, and maintain housing. There's a lot of elderly people. It was hard to, to move out of your home. That A lot of them had been there for, for a long time. And a regular Vancouver problem had suspects you might recognize today. A city council with one idea and an independently elected parks board with another. The building must have been a real thorn in the side of the parks board. It was right across the road and definitely blocked their view. So what you're saying, Mr. Fraser, is that the parks board is not willing to budge. The parks board official position right now is that we wish to have the building demolished so we can finish off the park development, the seawall. In the middle of the conflict, 33 renters, mostly lower income seniors, wondering their fate. So if my little heaven is going to be torn down, it's going to be very pathetic. However, I don't know of anything I can do about it. <laughs> Progress, you know. <laughs> Another key council vote to pay for seismic upgrades to save the building was scheduled for February 3rd, 1980. Everyone knew that the fate of the building was uh, hanging by a hair. But on February the 1st, the very uncanny fact that, that fire took place two days before the fate of the building was to be decided. Hmm. Coincidence? For 69 years, the Anglesey Lodge stood tall where English Bay Beach ended and Stanley Park began. Until, suddenly, it didn't. And they said fire, so I got my coat on and my purse and I came. The fire at the Anglesey came two days before City Council was to debate its future, after years of a dispute with the Park Board over whether to tear it down to complete that portion of the seawall. It was a little suspicious. It's not just the mayor that thought so. 
The only handwritten diary from a fire hall documenting the day's event said so as well. And an Emily Carr student who made a documentary about the blaze came to the same conclusion. Most of them in the building suspected it was arson. They thought it unusual that when that fire happened, that an unknown person had gone um, apartment to apartment urging the residents to get out. When I talked to a firefighter several years ago, he'd uh, been down in there and, and said that it had started right at the elevator shaft, which would have been the best place to set a fire if you're going to do that. Uh, he also told me that once they got a handle on the fire and it looked like they could save the building, they were ordered out. So it's, it's quite suspicious. The location of the fire, the stranger warning people, the sounds of explosions, the fire alarms not working, it all pointed in one direction. But just as soon as the investigation began, it ended. The superintendent of the park, his, his desk had a clear view of the bay with Anglesey gone. He almost gloated over his open view and how that open view just uh, was sort of the icing on the cake of Stanley Park. The VPD has no archives of its investigation. In a phone call, former Park Board Chair Russell Fraser denied the Park Board had anything to do with it. And the mayor says his occasional thoughts of suspicion were just that. Oh, part of my brain does, but there's, there's no evidence to, to back it on. And um, in any event, it, that solves the problem. Several months later, the building was torn down. The seawall completed. Dozens of seniors, all without fire insurance, sent to new housing across the city. One older woman I remember, she told me, I asked her what she missed about living there, and she said, Anglesey was home to me. I miss my home. Now, where I live, I'm dark, it's dark, and I'm shut in. And um, it was heartbreaking. Do you know, one of the problems with Vancouver is we've been too successful in becoming a kind of city that people want to come to. And uh, we're still victims of our own success. More often than not, we think about a city by what is there, not what is lost. And as people walk, bike, and run the seawall, there is no plaque to the building demolished 40 years ago on this day. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Vancouver. <laughs> Hi, this is Benji, Vancouver Studio Glass, and this is our Vancouver. When we bring you stories here at CBC Vancouver, we have award-winning photographers out capturing the images that say so much. Still images add context and bring a lot more to the understanding of an event or an issue. Here are some of the latest from what was happening this past week. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you can join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. For now, bye-bye.